Throughout history, humans have always been trying to influence centralized governments in ways that accommodate their needs and concerns. Human rights today are pretty much a reflection of that influence and guidance. So today, I thought it would be interesting to discuss the human rights standards of an African society, specifically amongst the Igbo people. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. On Patreon, you can find more in-depth courses on African history. And with a word from my sponsors, there's a new social media platform dedicated to educating and uplifting our people. No longer do we have to be censored for speaking our truth. OBT Social is black owned and operated and a place where you can post your businesses and even monetize your content. You can visit the website at obtsocial.com. Links to everything in the description box below. Let's begin by speaking about how modern human rights are defined in general, according to one scholar. Human rights have been defined as demands and claims which individuals or groups make on the society, some of which are protected by law and some of which are aspirations to be attained in the future. They constitute demands or rights which no one could be deprived of without a serious affront to justice. These rights are of civil, political, social, economic, and nature. Civil and political rights include such claims as the rights to self-determination, life, liberty, security, fair trial, free movement, freedom of worship, participation in one's government, right to nationality. Economic, social, and cultural rights in modern parlance will embrace inter alia the right to work, the right to fair remuneration, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to social security, the right to property, the right to participate in cultural life. Now it's important to understand that modern ideas concerning human rights have evolved over time, and no ancient or medieval society should be measured or judged by these modern standards. With that in mind, I thought it would be interesting to discuss the human rights advanced by Igbo society before the interaction or influence of any outside group. So what was the human rights situation in Igbo land? Well, before we get into that, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, if you will. Most, if not all, ancient and medieval societies practice the enslavement of other human beings, and this reality usually did not at all contradict any moral standard they may have held. This, of course, applies to Igbo land. So kindly keep in mind my previous statement about how the idea of human rights evolved over time. Anyway, let's try to get more of a grasp on the slavery topic in Igbo land. According to I. R. Amadi, it's generally accepted that chattel slavery did not exist in pre-colonial Igbo land and most other African societies. In the African sense, slavery should not be seen as a neat opposite of freedom in the way a Western mind would look at the subject. The total bundle of traits applicable especially in the Western viewpoint need not, and hardly did, apply to an African slave in its entirety. Many slaves enjoyed freedoms held by the free. Now this quote is not intended to excuse the tradition, but it's just a matter of perspective. Because the Western version of slavery tends to cloud our minds when it comes to the history of enslavement on the continent of Africa. Regardless, African societies, just like any other, were not perfect, and all people in that time would usually want to avoid the fate of the enslaved. Aside from that, human rights in Igbo land applied to Igbo people, and most enslaved people in Igbo land were either not ethnically Igbo or were considered outsiders for whatever reason and had no such rights. Igbo land consisted of numerous small political communities. This governmental structure is called an acephalous society. These societies tended to be small, with kinship playing a crucial role in social organization. Small political communities like these have been generally misunderstood because the idea of tradition or custom were considered the same as law, whereas in today's societies or other centralized societies of the past, custom and law may be separated. In Igbo land, both custom and law were and are enforceable through organized physical force. There is not much functional difference between law and custom, 
the only difference lying in their origin. By this distinction, some analysts have erroneously argued that stateless societies had no laws. Enforcement of laws in pre-colonial Igbo land could take the form of vengeance, feud, or outright judicial process instituted by constituted authority. Oral traditions are replete with instances in which these forms of enforcement occurred. They often lay at the root of many migrations. Most of these accounts are oral, but we do have a documented account from the Insibidi writing form concerning a judicial process involving adultery. This record is of an ikpi or judgment case, and the court was held under a tree as was the custom. The Insibidi ideographic document tells us that there was a ruling official who judged it along with his staff, who are enclosed in the circle. It's interesting because this document tells us it was a difficult case and people from outside the village were called on to help try the case. That's revealed in the encircled portion of section J. Now even though this particular court case may not be specifically Igbo, it does reflect the moral code and operations of the general area. One of the fundamental human rights was the right to life and property. The abhorrence shown to murder and theft was a good measure of the people's attachment to this basic right. In most Igbo communities, murder was avenged through private vengeance or feud. Within the same political unit, the principles of vengeance and feud would normally make for settlement and restitution, not necessarily involving retaliatory killing. There's a religious component to the human rights standards of Igbo society as well. For example, the right to property was deemed a very important human right. An individual violation of anyone's property aside from official restitution would also have to be dealt with by a ritual cleansing of the offenders, led by a religious authority, usually the Enri priest. Diviners and oracles also participated in the disciplining. A visit by them tended to quell crime and acted as a deterrent. Fundamental civil and political rights such as self-determination, liberty and security, the right to participate in government, were all subsumed in the political system. The village democracy, which was typical of Igbo traditional government, allowed for the participation of all male adults in the political life of the community. Nothing illustrates this more readily than the autonomous nature of individual political communities. The saying, Igbo enwe eze, the Igbo have no kings, dramatizes principle of self-determination and explains the absence of large centralized states and empires in pre-colonial Igbo land. Women did seem to have some influence on the political process in Igbo land, though it usually wasn't through conventional methods. Igbo women had to create their own avenues of contribution in a sense in order to influence the political system. According to I.R. Amadi, it would be wrong to say that women had no such rights. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on human rights in Igbo society. If you like these videos and want to support its continued development, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.